Now I earn a living. This shark swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than three thousand bucks, Chief. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell, shark! We've got a panel on our hands on the Fourth of July. Mr. Vaughn, Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Welcome back to the Jaws Obsession, where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for returning to another episode. I am your host, Ryan Daco, and author of The Book of Quint, the soon-to-be worldwide published prequel to Jaws. And this episode is going to be the episode before Halloween, where some of you might want to dress up as your favorite Jaws character. And one of the many costume choices and cosplay lines of clothing, aside from the Quint M51 field jacket or the Brody Amity Police Department jacket, you have the Hooper jean jacket. We also have the anchor coat that Mayor Vaughn wears, and it's only fitting that we are going to dive right into that. It's a very exciting episode. This is going to be a groundbreaking episode. Anchor Coat History, episode 71. Here on the Jaws Obsession, we have prided ourselves with breaking new ground into Jaws analytics and diving deep inside the Jaws universe to find hidden gems and hidden treasures that might have been there in this movie that we have all enjoyed since 1975. As we approach the 50th anniversary in 2025, they said it couldn't be done. How could a podcast be designed around just one film? With every new episode, we continue to try to prove that it can be done if that movie is the greatest movie of all time. And here we are on a 71st episode. I want to welcome everyone back. Thank you for your time in listening and for the new thousands of new listeners that we have all around the world. After episode 70, we talked about AI fan casting, the Book of Quint, what would a possible Book of Quint feature film look if the superstar Henry Cavill was cast to play Quint. The images took off around the world. We had a reel that showed fan casting images of Henry Cavill as Quint. Within two weeks, it had over 40,000 views. Aside from the Jaws fans that were all excited, we had an overwhelming support of what those images showed, that the possibility of what we're on the cusp, what we're on the edge of obtaining here. It's a, it's a new energy that there is a there I can feel it right now that there is a new energy that has been injected into the Jaws universe to the Jaws fandom and that energy is the cavalry the Henry Cavalry Army that has been riding over the hill, if you want to call them the Cavaliers. We've had thousands of new views at the Instagram, at Book of Quint, at the Book of Quint page over there. You can feel that there is a there is a movement going on. And that movement is the Henry Cavill fans think that this is a great project for their man, Mr. Cavill. And the Jaws fans are also seeing this as something that adds more context and more uh, history 
to this greatest movie of all time, Jaws, and this can all come together. So what happened was after that, after episode 70, we had some great help. A user on Instagram, HC38Jersey, I can't thank her enough for how she has been forwarding all the different messages and, and reels. We had other users like Ali and Vivian and Karin and Vivian from countries as far away as, as Peru and Brazil that the reach is extending and now we're, we're, get, we're, we're getting new listeners. It's adding to the excitement, which is the Book of Quint is going to be a worldwide release on November 15th, 2023. We are now full into our 31-day countdown, the 31 days to the Book of Quint over at Book of Quint on Instagram. Every day I am posting a new slide, a rendering, an AI rendering of what a possible Book of Quint feature film might look like. And we're just asking the question, why can't there be a prequel to the film Jaws in 2025 to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Jaws? What I like is that it reminds me of back in the 80s when I was growing up, there were Jaws 2 and then Jaws 3 trading cards. I don't know if any of you remember getting those. When I was a child back in uh, on summers on Cape Cod, I would beg my parents at the Wellfleet drive-in at the flea market. They would have a flea market there on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and I would see the trading cards, and they would get me a couple packs. And of course, remember, you had the little piece of chewing gum that tasted like cardboard. Probably is very unsafe, but we consumed that anyways. And then I had all the little trading cards of Brody off of Cable Junction, putting the undersea uh, power line into the shark's mouth. All the little trading cards, you could actually watch the movie in still frames. And you could actually, if you collected your set, you could then take that, that, that set and you could line it up so you're watching the movie in your mind using those still frames. And that's essentially what we're seeing now is using the tool of AI is that we can actually take these digital trading cards and you can collect those and actually see the movie trailer play out as you flip through it over at Instagram at Book of Quint. It's also showing the potential. We're showing Universal Pictures the potential of what this project can be. It's fresh, it's new, it's exciting. You can see that the Book of Quint feature film would be a great opportunity for the acting, the cinematography, and the artistry of it all to come back into play. And as we know, it's difficult to get audiences into the cinemas. And if a project has that artistic integrity behind it, audiences will, will come out not only to support, but to as that part of that spectacle. That's kind of what we are showing as we are in the development stages of the book to screen adaptation with the William Pettit Agency in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is all part of the fun. All right. It's why not have fun? A new novel is coming into the world, November 15th, and the Jaws universe is going to be expanded. We have to thank Benchley IPLLC for the permission to publish this using the characters of Peter Benchley. And it's just very exciting to see. So I invite everyone over to take a look. We started with day 31. Uh, today is day 21. I am going to be putting day 20, uh, 20 up tonight because we are on British time. That's what we're going is Amberly Publishing is the publishing company that will be. That's where the book starts with. It's going to be published over there first, November 15th, 2023. Very exciting. Really quick news before we progress about the Jaws obsession here. I just received word. I just received word only moments ago that over at listennotes.com that we have been upgraded and we are now ranked in the top 2.5% of all podcasts around the world. Uh, right now, as it stands on the system, we have uh, the global rank. This podcast, The Jaws Obsession, is one of the top 2.5% most popular shows out of 3,208,542 podcasts globally ranked by the listen score, the estimated popularity score over at listennotes.com. So it uses a series of metrics and all that to compile the global rankings of all podcasts. And we are now in the top 2.5% of 3.2 million podcasts. That makes us the number one Jaws podcast in the world. And we couldn't have done that without you, the listener, to keep showing up 
that you have told everyone you know about the Jaws obsession. It's just, I can't thank you enough because without listeners, what good is the broadcast? We need listeners to interact. When you write me emails, I can actually create that into uh, show content, and therefore that's where these episodes come from. Many of these episodes were born out of questions that you have asked me about details in Jaws, and I can't thank you enough for what this uh, this ranking means for me personally. The top 2.5% never expected it in a million years when I started this show back on December 7th, 2021. Never expected to see it grow like this, this fast. I have to thank you very much for your time that you've committed to listening to this show. 70 episodes, this is now 70, the 71st episode. We're around four days of content that you and I have spent together talking about Jaws. I've had various guests on here. I want to thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. It's just very exciting to see that 2.5% ranking. So that's, uh, we're up there, but you know what? We're not stopping. I'm going to keep going. We're going to keep going because we got to get to 2% because that's where the back to the future podcast is. And I believe that jaws is just as, if not more popular than back to the future. And when we get to that 2%, we are now going to prove it that we, that jaws can be just as talked about and analyzed as, ba as a back to the future trilogy is over there at the back to the future guy. So a uh, little bit of a friendly, a friendly uh, back and forth, a little bit of a friendly competition with the other universal film, Back to the Future, that is also uh, has a podcast following, and they are ranked in the top 2% of all podcasts worldwide. So here we are, 2.5%, only with 71 episodes, with less than two years. We're well on our way to that 2%. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's go into some emails and comments because we have some more announcements with the Book of Quint. We, we are on all podcasting platforms around the world with the Jaws Obsession, but there is also the YouTube page carries the podcast as well. And I believe YouTube is starting a YouTube music that is going to try to compete with Spotify. Uh, the Jaws Obsession already has all those files transferred over. If you, if you do frequent YouTube music, in the they are going to have a podcasting wing of YouTube, and the Jaws Obsession is involved with that as well. So over on episode 70, you can also re leave comments to each episode over at YouTube. I try to see them all. I can't really answer everybody, but some of the comments that after episode 70 with fan casting Quint, where we talked about Henry Cavill, we had some positives and negatives. We had, uh, we had Steve in South London. He said, another great episode. I can see Henry in this role makes me excited for what the movie could be. Another possible choice that is a British and B a great character actor who brings something to, of himself to every role like Robert Shaw did and C has starred in Hollywood movies is Tom Hardy. I could see him as Quint too. And yes, Steve in South London believes that uh, if it's not Henry Cavill, then why not Tom Hardy? Yes, ask those questions. Why not? Uh, Lancey then came in and said, sorry, love Henry Cavill, but not to play Quint. So there's a disagreement, but that's okay. It's okay to disagree and agree here. That's what the Jaws obsession is about. It's about bringing everyone together under one big tent and actually have fun doing it. Disagree, agree. Lancey, who, if not Henry Cavill, who do you think should play Quint? I would love to know your opinion on that. And that's what we're doing here is we're just asking the question, why? Why not? And this is the best part about the whole fan casting idea. When you read the novel, The Book of Quint, you could plug in anyone you want. You are the director. You are the casting agent. You could cast anyone you want. If you want Robert Shaw himself, the young, a young Robert Shaw. You can watch the old Buccaneer episodes of the Buccaneers, and you can see young Robert Shaw there. I have the the DVD collection myself. Go watch him, and then you can read the Book of Quint, and Robert Shaw is then playing a young Quint. If you're a Henry Cavill fan, plug in Henry Cavill and read the Book of Quint. Watch it in your mind. That's the best part is that you have the power here. It's up to you now. When you read the book, you're the director. And that's what's so exciting about that. The way I wrote the, the book of Quint, there's a certain style. And uh, I could probably talk for two hours on just some of the techniques that I used to try to translate that story the best of my ability to allow you to watch the movie in your mind. And that is how the, the novel is written. And we've been getting great reviews on it. 
and it's exciting to see. So I want to thank uh, the uh, the back and forth that's been going on when we when I introduced the concept of fan casting and these great images that you've that you've all seen over at our Instagram. We are extremely busy with our lives, and there uh, you only have 24 hours in every day. And some of us work a massive amount of hours at our careers. So when you have some personal time, some downtime, we are now into maximizing that time. So the streaming movies, the streaming platforms, a podcast like you're listening on this, no commercials, get through it, get that content, enjoy your time, enjoy your time that you're listening or you're watching. Uh, You don't have to sit and wait through endless commercial loops anymore. And I think going forward with the rollout of this book of Quint, I think that this is a template for going forward. Well-written novels, well-researched books will be the vehicle to pick up the audience, to rile the audience up. The risk by the big studios is very great now with movies, with films costing more than ever. And the ticket sales are not as guaranteed as they once were. And the competition between streaming platforms, I believe that will be a resurgence in novels. Once before, the screenplay was the big power broker back in the 90s. It slowly transferred over to novels where now is there a, is there a fan base for the particular book? And then will that be made into a movie? So we are not doing anything new, but it is kind of maybe this is a new trend. The podcast coupled with the novel And the following is coalesced around that and then see where that goes after publication, after a worldwide release. We're doing new things here. We're keeping it fresh, but we're keeping it Jaws. And that's what's exciting to see. There's new life. And I, for one, am excited. I can't wait to share this story. It means so much for me to share this story with all of the listeners and all of the fans around the world. As an author, the payoff of the hard work is watching the story get delivered to the readers. It's very exciting to see. Just some thoughts there, just some thoughts. And we're going to continue on here. So I had an email from Ross uh, wrote in, Hi, Ryan, can I pre-order the book from the States or do I have to wait until it comes out in the U.S.? Also, is it paperback? Hope all is well, Ross Richardson. Uh, Yes, Ross, it is paperback. This is the trade paperback release of the Book of Quint. Because it is an English publisher, it is going to be made over in England on November 15th is when the book is going to be released as well as Europe markets, Australia, those of that's the availability over there. And I think I, I saw some availabilities in Japan as well and many European countries. It can't be guaranteed until July, January 23rd, 2024 in the United States and Canada because of uh, logistics and it's got to go on a shipping container and all that. And the books have to be brought over here to the distribution centers over here. There are vendors over in the UK that will ship to you over the United States as the book is available in mid-November. So you will be able to get it here. One is Blackwells. Blackwells Blackwells.co.uk is a bookshop. They are a bookshop that is on every, it is, they are on every campus and university over in the United Kingdom. And uh, they they are listing the Book of Quint. But what they're also listing is, it's a pre-order, the price includes delivery to the United States. So if you go to our link tree, if you go to jawsob.com, bookofquint.com, you go to the Book of Quint page or in the contacts page, you're going to see the link for the link tree. There's a link there for Blackwell's that will take you right to the Book of Quint page. That price is... It's now $20.85. That includes the delivery to the United States. That's a great deal. So you can see that Blackwell's has stepped up to accommodate the many U.S. readers of the Book of Quint that want to get the book before the Christmas season. And they are doing that with shipping included with the price of the book. So what a good deal. Thank you very much to Blackwell's for doing that. And I'm sure other vendors will be popping up with similar sales because the demand is increasing with every day. The demand is increasing and we're going to see lopsided numbers. Pre-sales are not going to be as high in the United States because everybody's pre-ordering over in the UK because people do not want to wait for the Book of Quint. They want to see it now. They want to start reading right away, which is very exciting. And I want to thank everyone 
for doing that. It's, it's just that helps with the metrics that the distribution companies read. This is all very important. So the pre-orders are, we have to have a good pre-order campaign going on. We have to have that. Essentially, we do, not just from this broadcast, but from the Instagram page as well. It's, it's just great to see. We have book reviews are now being received. We have three sites where we need all early Book of Quint readers, all the readers from the Indiegogo campaign. You guys sent in the best reviews. I've been reading them on the show here. Anyone who has sent in a review who has read the Book of Quint, we need those good five-star reviews that you sent in. We have barnesandnoble.com. We have waterstones.com. We also have over at Goodreads. The Book of Quint is now on Goodreads. Uh, librarians have band together. They have entered that in, and Goodre Goodreads has now accepted the Book of Quint. It has its own page. On those three sites, Waterstones in the UK, barnesandnoble.com in the US, and Goodreads, they are now accepting reviews. So if you can go over there, I would be very grateful for the five-star reviews that you guys have been leaving me. And just copy and paste your review over there. So now everybody else can read what you all have sent me. A lot of high traffic is going to be coming through there, and reviews can make or break a book. So those early Book of Quint readers, uh, the letter that I wrote to you was, you are an ambassador for Quint. And this is all part of it, is that to get that word out, to let people that are considering reading this book, that your review will help them put this book right into their rotation. The next novel that they're going to read will be the Book of Quint. Over at Goodreads, there's something along the lines of 40 million users over there, avid readers, people that uh, keep in charge. They have book reading challenges with each other. You can create a profile. You can put what books you have read recently or ones that you plan on reading. There are a lot of users over there, and it syncs right up with Amazon. So people will go from Amazon over to Goodreads to see what they uh, of how a book is being received over there. And to become a verified Goodreads author, a little bit of a milestone there. And so I actually was, uh, I just got that notification today as well. So uh, you can see my profile over there, Ryan Daco. I can also take messages through Goodreads now, as well as answer questions. If you have any questions regarding uh, writing, we can have a conversation over there. So great to see we're over there at goodreads.com. The last announcement here that I have is Cole's Books. I want to talk about Cole's Books. Absolutely, we have to recognize Caroline over at Cole's Books. Um, over the weekend, I hand-signed 100 book plates, which are official labels that are signed by the author, and then they will be fixed to the title page of the book. I hand-signed 100 book plates. I individually numbered them as well to increase collectability. Those autographs have now been sent back, and they are now received over at Cole's Books. There is a link for the Book of Quint by Ryan Daco signed edition. They have a link now up. You can pre-order that. There is, uh, it doesn't appear to be any price difference. You just order that through Cole's Books and they will send that to you. They ship worldwide and they'll send you the uh, one of the first 100 autographs that I did for this printing of the Book of Quint. I want to thank Caroline over at Cole's Books for the opportunity to do that. Any collectors out there or anyone looking to get a little bit a little bit more something special on top of the Book of Quint, you can go purchase the autographed copy of the Book of Quint through them. Cole's Books is located at 22 Crown Walk, Pioneer Square in Bicester, Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom. They have, if you go to coles-books.co.uk, you can find their contact. They have a phone number right at the bottom, and you can you can also see um, the link for the uh, regular edition of the Book of Quint or the signed edition. I will put those links in the description of this broadcast as well. Very exciting to see. Thank you very much, Caroline and Cole's books. I also learned to pronounce Bister from Dave Bowen. That's one of the things that you'll have to bear with me if I mispronounce some names uh, over in the United Kingdom that we have uh, sometimes very different pronunciations, but it's great to learn these little these little secrets. So yes, over Cole's Books and Bister. So now that that is all out of the way, now let's just go full on Jaws. Why are we here today? Because we promised to dive into a great archaeological find, cinematic archaeology. 
I, I coined that phrase a, a while ago when I was on Martha's Vineyard uh, with Mike Currid of the Eggertown Tour Company, and I was going over locations of Jaws, and I was actually going right down to the rock level, finding rocks that exist in the movie uh, uh, in various locations and that are still there on Martha's Vineyard. They might be shifted or in different positions, but it's exciting to see. And I called it, I started saying, this is cinematic archaeology. And that just doesn't stop. It doesn't just, just stop at the rocks that are there and the landscaping, but also the props and the wardrobe. It's very exciting to find more information on something that we know so well. Jaws is such a part of our lives and we are so in tune to this film. You might have seen it 200, 300, 400 times in your life. But the simple fact is, is that there are things in Jaws that we take for granted. And if you know the special details behind them, we actually can see the movie is a lot more amazing than we may have previously thought. And we have John Tedder back with us in the Jaws Obsession. We're going to make some Jaws history here. John, I'd like to welcome you back to the show. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great. It's always wonderful to come back. And it's always great having you here because we know that when John Tedder is on the show, that we are going to be learning something. We are going to be learning specific, specific details into Jaws, and I'm excited to learn as well. So this is, I'm, I'm very, I'm anticipating this. John, you and I purposely have not even talked much about this in order to get this as fresh as possible. Um, Correct. We have new listeners to the show all the time. And I would like to mm -hmm. also say that John comes from orcarebuild.com, where he is rebuilding the orca in full scale. It's a, it's a massive project that he has undertaken. If you go to orcarebuild.com, you can follow all the links to his YouTube and Instagram and follow that project. He also has a shop over at etsy.com called Quince Shark and Shack. We learn about Jaws through John's contributions to the show. As you know, he was the technical advisor on the Book of Quint. So to be on episode 71, this is pretty amazing right here. So John, at this time, could you please tell the listeners of the Jaws Obsession what you are presenting to us here tonight? Well, what I'm presenting here is a piece of Jaws history that people have been wondering about for a very long time. And what people have been wondering about is who made the anchor jacket that Murray Hampton wore as Mayor Vaughn. The infamous anchor jacket. We know that he wears that at the beginning of the film, famous fairy sequence. It's all psychological. You yell Barracuda. Everybody says, huh? What? You yell Shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. And then also it makes a few other appearances in the movie as well. The, the, the billboard sequence, right, John? It does. Sick vandalism. That is a deliberate mutilation of a public service message. Now, I want those little paint-happy bastards caught and hung up by their Buster Brown. August. <laughs> this anchor jacket has been referenced and has been thought of. Many decades of Jaws fans have tried to recreate it or have referenced it, and it's just it's become synonymous with the character of Mayor Vaughn. What is amazing here is that John has actually located an actual anchor jacket, one of the actual jackets that were made by by the same shop that made the um, Mayor Vaughn jacket. We're going to get into that. We're going to unpack all of this. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to understand. Before we get into this, you're going to have to go to either our show notes over at our Telegram channel, at JawsOB, at Telegram, or you can actually go to our Instagram, where we are going to have detailed photos of this jacket that John has contributed to the show. Actually, while you're listening to this interview, you can go and see the detail of this jacket, the photos and what it looks like as we talk about it from here on out. So those photos will be referenced by myself and John. And if you go over there now and pull up those photos, it will make for a better experience in the interview. So to start with this, we're going to have to understand more about the anchor suit coat worn by Murray Hamilton in Jaws. How did you get on the trail of this item? You are now in possession of this jacket. And can you reveal how did you get on the trail of it and how did you acquire it? It was something that I'd always looked for just like every other Jaws fan and you know one day I was doing a, a search and I saw there was a video that popped up on YouTube and it said the anchor jacket found so of course I clicked on it and uh, the this gentleman by the name of Matthew Armandrout he had made a video about it talking about how he had got it through his family and 
and I ended up finding him on Facebook. So I sent him a message, and over the course of a few months, I had finally asked him, would you like to sell it? And he said, well, it's not mine to sell. It belongs to my family. He said, you'll have to talk to my mother about it. So over the course of a year, his mother and I, Wendy, we had talked back and forth. We'd text, uh, be on a phone call with each other. Over the course of a year, that's how long it took, just getting to know each other, you know, building a repertoire with people and mm -hmm. really building a friendship. Finally, she told me, she said, you know, I think we're ready to let go of it. Did they do a background on you? Could, did they kind of see that you were yeah, involved with Jaws and you were involved in Jaws history and all that, so they knew that it was going to a good home? They, they did. She did. Because mm -hmm. she had uh, actually found my YouTube channel, and she had found uh, the interview I did with Rennie Ben David when I went to go buy the harpoon gun. And she said that her and her husband went through the entire thing, watched it in one sitting, and it's almost two hours long. Mm -hmm. And she told me, she said, you know, after we got done watching it, I knew that you were the right person for this jacket to go to. That's unbelievable. For those of you that don't mm -hmm. know, we we highlighted John's acquiring of the one of the uh, harpoon rifles that was on the set of Jaws back with episode 55, Harpoon Rifle History. If you go back and listen to episode 55, and then John has a video of that on his YouTube channel over at YouTube at Orca Rebuild. So they obviously saw that it was going to go to good hands. How did you, at that time though, how did you, from a distance, how did you verify that this was an actual anchor jacket and not a reproduction? Could you verify that without seeing it from a distance? Did they send you detailed photos? They did. They did send me detailed photos, and I got to looking at it through everything. And you, number one, you can tell that the material is very special. You can tell that. Mm -hmm. And then you can also tell on the inside there is a little strip up at the top that you could put your finger through. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd put it through a hanger, and it says dry clean only. And you can tell that it's it's older. You had the hunch that it was older and this was the real deal. So you went in. That was all within this year, right? Within 2023? Yes. This jacket, it was coming from the Massachusetts area, correct? The jacket itself was made in New York. I, I had bought it in Pennsylvania. Okay, okay. So, uh, so it was the Pennsylvania is where the family was located then. Yes. How did, yes. Uh, can, uh, without going too much, we're going to get into the, uh, we're going to get into the history of it that you've uncovered after you acquired the jacket, but did the family communicate to you how they got a hold of the jacket? They did. Um, I actually interviewed them. <clears throat> and it'll be coming to my YouTube channel. Oh, that's fantastic. When I get time to edit it. How they had come across it was the mother and the father, when they were in high school, they both had the same teacher uh, named Bob Omrod, and later their son had him. Well, something Mr. Omrod would do every other week was pull up a picture or a piece of clothing similar to what somebody had worn in a movie, and if you guessed what movie or television show it came from, you would get a prize on Friday, and it was usually like a king-size candy bar. Oh, that's fantastic. So <laughs> Matt had went to school one day, it was on Friday, and he said that he walked in class. He immediately knew what it was, so he won. And later, Mr. Uh, Omrod happened to not live far from his parents, and this was several years later. Wendy, Matt's mother, mm -hmm. was driving by, and she saw him out there in his yard, and she, she stopped, and she went in and talked to him. And she said, you know, Matt's in your class and everything. And they got to talking, and he said, would, would you like to see it? And she said, yes. So he went and showed it to her, and he said, there was actually a fire in my basement where the boiler uh, blew up, and it was covered in soot, and I had to have it professionally dry clean. He, he gave it to her, actually a gift for her husband because his favorite movie was Jaws. Wow. And uh, she gave it to him on Valentine's Day, I think. That was 10 years ago, I think, if I remember correctly. Wow, so this retired teacher gifted mm -hmm. the jacket because he, he, that he knew his former student was a big Jaws fan. The jacket comes uh, gets into the family through that, that route, and now it mm -hmm. falls into your hands. Without a doubt, it's, it is authentic. It is one of the jackets from the line, from the same line that was worn by Murray Hamilton in Jaws. Let's switch right on to the description of the jacket. For everyone, go look at the photos so you can see what we're looking at at the same time. You can see what I'm seeing. Uh, one of the facts that many Jaws fans, including myself, have never realized that it isn't a solid color. That when you watch Jaws, the jacket looks different in the certain lighting scenarios that Mayor Vaughn is standing in, whether they're out at the, on the water, on the ferry ride, it has maybe a, almost a bluish hint to it, and then it's more of a grayish hint over at the billboard. There, there's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting color, 
and you have provided detailed close-up forensic-style photos to the Jaws Obsession listeners to show us that there, it's an intricate material that this jacket is made out of. Could you explain more there? So it is a cotton polyester blend uh, to make twill is what it is, and it is navy and white, and it's pinstriping is what it is, and it's very close together. So when you look at it from a distance or on film or in a picture, it's going to look gray, but it's not. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's a it's a fine pinstriping, so fine that it looks gray when you stand back because it's a navy blue and white. So it's that fine pinstriping, and if everyone looks at the detailed photos, you actually get right up close to the jacket. You can actually see what it is. This is much more of an intricate jacket than just a simple pattern with anchors stuck on it or anchors sewn on it. The, it's it's mm-hmm. it's a much more intricate material and fabric. And and now you went about deconstructing the history of this jacket. How was the material made? So right down to the the very material's existence. Who made the jacket? And can you give some history into its creation? Well, first let me tell you how I found out who made it. Okay, great. Because the there were no labels on the inside except for the dry clean only label. And I thought to myself, this is going to be impossible to do. I'm never going to figure this out because there's a lot of blazers and sports coats and jackets that look like that. So the only thing I really had to go on was the fabric itself and the way the jacket looked and the design and the flaps and everything on it. Mm-hmm. That was the only thing I had to go on. So over the course of two, two and a half, three weeks, searching through Google, searching through eBay, just looking at old vintage jackets. And I come across one that looks identical to it, except it obviously wasn't an anchor twill jacket, but it was a gray jacket. It was a true gray gray jacket. And there was another one that was a cream colored. It was cut the exact same way. Okay. It had a label on the inside that said Chip, New York. So I Googled them. It is a, they've been out of business for a while and they made jackets for the Kennedys. So the owner and the person that had started it was Sidney Winston. His son later took it over and then he eventually retired, closed it down. We're just going to use one of those websites where you can do a background check on somebody. Right. So I did. And it gave me an address and a phone number. And I thought, and I was sitting there looking at it and I go, if I call this guy, how do I explain this, how I got his number, and how I'm calling him, and why? And I thought to myself, well, you never don't know unless you do. So I gave him a ring, and I explained to him who I was and how I'd found him while I was calling. Okay, so get the viewers onto the same page. It's it's called Chip Clothing and Furnishings, uh, C-H-I-P-P, double P. So uh, the, the Chip is the name of the uh, clothing store. It was located in New York. Mm-hmm. You found out the, the name of the gentleman that started it. Is that who we're? Is that yes. what you're talking about? Okay. And then you just looked up on a. You, you found the name on on one of the search sites, and you just said, "I'm going to go give him a ring." He picks yeah, well, up. Yeah, I found his son. Oh, we found his son. I found his son because his because um, the son is still alive, but the father is not. Okay, so the son is who you're calling. Yes. And he picks up. He picks up. Okay. And I explained to him why I was calling what it was about, how I'd found out what his number was. And it must have been very odd for him. Like, I I understand that he's in his 90s. He's uh, 96 or 97, 97. But he was very nice about it, very polite. And I asked him flat out, I said, well, I got to know, did you make this jacket? And he said, well, what does it look like? And I told him, I said, I can email you a picture of it if you have an email. He said, yeah, I have an email. I emailed it to him. And he said, that is my jacket. He said, that is the one that my father designed, and I helped him make it. He said but that they had made it in the uh, 60s is actually when they had made it. In the 60s. Wow. So he made he, so he made the jacket. He recognized it immediately. He recognized the material. He made the jacket with his father in the 60s in this chip clothing store in New York City. Yes, they made all their uh, clothing, by all their patterns, everything. Yeah. The uh, jackets, everything was hands. The fabric, the bolts of fabric were hand spun. Wow. So it's okay. So he basically recognized it, and then he can we reveal the name? Or do, and his name is? Yeah, his name is Paul Winston. 
is his name. Mr. Paul Winston is 97, and it was his father and him that actually made these jackets. A lot of suit, mm-hmm. lot of suit jackets. We have an advertisement from Chip C H I Double P Chip Clothing. We have advertisements, and it shows that they made all sorts of suit jackets, and they are advertise themselves as tradition of Chip, our tradition of excellence in quality clothing and furnishings for gentlemen, and our unique approach to color, fabric, and fit. The personal selection at Chip. Step into the world of personal selection, where you. Create your own distinctive preferences in suits and sport coats with our exclusive personal selection service. Mm-hmm. The Chips Clothing Store is now a bread a bread and butter habits to be made. It's now it's. Do you know the address of what Chips was? The actual address? Yes, I do. The address was fourteen East Forty Fourth Street, New York City, New York. Fourteen East Forty Fourth Street in New York City, New York. And we have an updated mm-hmm. photo of what it looks like now. It's a bread and butter habits to be made shop. And we also have a, a couple of drawings from old catalogs uh, from yes. the 60s of what it looked like back then. And we're going to put all that up in the show notes. This really interesting one that you have here from the Life magazine photo of the inside of the shop and actual with the with all the gentlemen in different uh, sports coats. You see the chairs, the fabric. You see the special fabrics that they made. Is the son or the owner in in the, this photo at all or no? So the gentleman in the back that is wearing the plaid, that he's wearing glasses, he has real cut short hair, plaid and holding a bolt of fabric. Mm-hmm. Um, that is his father. That is Sydney. So that's Sydney. And then that's the father. Paul is standing next to him. Yes. And then Paul is next to him in the um, with the white shirt and the plaid jacket. Yes. So those that's the father and son in the center frame, way in the back. Father Sydney is on the right. Son Paul mm-hmm. is on the left. In this Life magazine image, black and white image that we have of inside the shop where this jacket was made. And there's the two cloth makers and tailors. Sydney and his son, Paul, are right in the center in the back there. Uh, Sydney's the one wearing glasses. So these are the two gentlemen right there. We actually have a photo of them. Without them, there would have been no famous anchor jacket that made its way into Jaws. What a treat to actually have the history behind this jacket and to actually put a name and a face to the history behind this jacket and uh, which which has been so ingrained in all of our memories about this movie jaws the infamous anchor jacket that mayor vaughn wears this gentleman and his father would hand create a personal a selection of suit coats for very wealthy customers that would have uh, that could go in there order handmade jackets with handmade fabric. That's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they really specialized for Ivy League schools such as Harvard, Yale, places like that, and they also they they dress the Kennedys. So you can actually go and find articles about that where they dress the Kennedys. They dress the Kennedys. How about that? So. So he's telling you that he's made that they made these jackets. Did they say how many of these anchor this anchor style pinstriping jacket was made? How many were made, and do they know where those coats went? So there are only three ever made. Three. There was three. Oh, three ever so made. The first one. <laughs> yeah, there was only three. That's unbelievable. Um, That's unbelievable. And you have one of the three. So let. Let's it, John. Let's just let it. Do we know what happened to the other two? Well, we definitely know for what happened for certain what happened to one. Um, his father kept the first one. The first one was a 44 regular. His father kept that one for himself and he was later buried in it. Mm -hmm. And then the second anchor jacket was a 44 regular. And according to him, it was bought and sold to the Kennedy family. But he didn't say by who, but he said it was in 1961. 1961 to the Kennedy family, okay? And the third jacket was a 46 long, and it was sold sometime in 67 to 68. Okay, 67 to 68, and that was sold to someone else. So three of them, mm-hmm. three of them were made by this intricate fabric that was handmade by this company. And those three went out. One was kept by the owner. And he was later buried in that. One went to the Kennedy family, and one went to another customer. 
And you have, mm. so, so basically that leaves only two possible jackets that were out there. Um, that for the one with the Kennedy family in the 60s, in the early 60s, Right, and then and then one in the late '60s was sent out there. So there's only really two jackets that actually could have been in Jaws. Correct. This is this is wild. This is it's just wild stuff. So okay. So did he, did he have any other details about the shop? Did he have any other things to say about how they m- went about making this or designing it? Any other details that he could give you? Well, they did a bunch of other designs. They did tennis rackets. They did golf. They did things that were geared towards sporting. And my theory is is that his father had the idea of doing one. The, the jackets was more geared towards people in country clubs and yacht clubs because in, in the New York area and places mm-hmm. like that, that was a uh, golf tennis and sailing and things of that nature were things that people in uh, country clubs and yacht clubs would do. So my, my theory is that that was more geared towards them. That's so interesting. So they, they did have other variants with tennis rackets. That's just so interesting mm-hmm. that here we have now, we have the variant that had the anchors on going towards the yacht clubs. It fits, it fits the character of mayor Vaughn. It fits the Amity aesthetic. It, it would fit that he would have a jacket like this in 1974, the annual regatta mm-hmm. in uh, in Amity. So this all fits. That's why this jacket is so perfect for the character. Could you explain a little bit about the pink variant suit, the women's suit that was also made? Will you, I understand you have a photo of that. Yes, and that will also be in the show notes. So the variant is the exact same thing as what the anchor jacket is, except the navy color is red so it looks pink because of the white but it's actually red right right so that's amazing in of itself that these guys were able to create this type of fabric where they said where a a lady would come in and request a uh, a suit for her at the time and they made it it looks pink from when you stand back but when you get up close it's actually a very fine red and white pinstriping same anchor pattern right there I remember you and I talked about trying to locate the roll of fabric, that if you could locate this mm-hmm. roll of fabric, you could find out exactly where the jackets went or how they were made. Uh, what did they do with the rest of the fabric that they made? Obviously, they made the three, the three jackets, the three coats for the men's pinstriping with the, with the anchors. But what did they do with the, the excess, the rest of the fabric? So the rest of the fabric, the rest of the bolt of the fabric was actually used to make pillowcases and they were sent to a local yacht club. Uh, now where they went from there, I don't know. And I did not get the name of the yacht club because there would have been several at that time. I think that's amazing. So a local yacht club was able to get either pillowcases or pillows pillows that were made out of this fabric. So somewhere out there, to all you Jaws uh, obsession, to all you Jaws obsession collectors out there, somewhere out there, there are pillows with the same anchor pattern made with the same pinstriping fabric that was the Mayor Vaughn jacket. And wouldn't that be a very interesting addition to anyone's collection out there? Put it right up next to your mm-hmm. book of Quint. That would be that would be ideal at this point in time. Here we are. Everybody has to realize what we're, what we're dealing with here is that we actually have the only, in my estimation, the only surviving jacket that came from the line of jackets that were made. There was only three made. And one of them went into, got found its way onto the set of Jaws in 1974 in the costuming department. Do we have any idea about how it would have went from either the Kennedy family or it would have went from the uh, the mystery buyer in the late 60s and then find its way into the mid-70s in 1974 on the set of Jaws in Martha's Vineyard? Do we have any idea or any theories Let's look at, let's just do the 44 and the 46 one at a time. So assuming that the 44 did belong to one of the Kennedys, as he had said, Mm -hmm. it could have belonged to any of them. Now, Hyannis is not very far from Martha's Vineyard. They spent time on Martha's Vineyard. Ted Kennedy very famously spent time on Martha's Vineyard. Well, infamously at that, Mm -hmm. on Martha's Vineyard there at Chappaquiddick. So it's not a stretch to say that, when they were getting rid of clothes that they gave it to a Salvation Army or a Goodwill or a local thrift store. Exactly, right? So that's a good theory right there because we do know he was obviously with the whole Chappaquiddick that he was there and it's a 44 regular. Is that the jacket you have? What the size the size you have is the, the, the jacket that you're in possession of? That's a 44 regular? It's a 44 regular. Okay. 
the same same size that went to the Kennedys. Correct. Okay, 44 regular went to the Kennedys. We know that the owner and creator of the jacket is buried in... He is buried in the second 44. He's buried in the second 44. And the other mystery jacket that's out there is a 46? Correct. Okay. This is unbelievable. Okay, so so theoretically, the 44 regular that you have, this has to be, this is the one that went to the Kennedys. This, it has to be. Yes. Yes. So you have the one that went to the Kennedy family that you are now in possession of. That's how we've, we've so we've, we've established this through the son of the owner of Chip's clothing store in New York City that made the jacket. There was only two 44 regulars made, and he... John is in possession, and one went to the Kennedys. One is now uh, with the owner who is buried in it. So John is in possession of the 44 regular, and that's got to be the one that was with the Kennedys. Wow, how amazing is this? Now, here is the tie. If this is the jacket that was used on the set of Jaws, Murray Hamilton, his height was 5'9"? What was his height? Do we know what Murray Hamilton's height was? 5'9", 5'10". 5'9", 5'10". He is more of a 44 regular size than a 46, correct? Correct, because I wear a 46 long myself. Right. So for Hamilton to wear a 44 would be about right. That's why we are so close to IDing this as the possible jacket that was worn in Jaws. It's the 44 regular. It's Murray Hamilton's size. Uh, went to the Kennedy family. Kennedy's all around Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. And ideally, this would have found its way into a thrift store or some sort of shop that where they were doing costuming. The costuming department was looking for wardrobe, and they found this anchor jacket and it made its way onto the set and then used on screen in Jaws. So this is where the everyone's going to be questioning. Screen used, screen used. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Everyone's always talking about screen used. What I find fascinating is that you and I have done uh, screen analysis of this jacket. And one side of the jacket is an exact match with the one worn by Murray Hamilton in Jaws. It's an exact match, but the other side has minor variants. Did you did you not ask him about possible alterations? Was a coat ever sent back for alterations at Chip's clothing store in New York City? Yes, I did. So what he had told me, and I have all of this written down, he said in 1974, the anchor jacket sport coat, a 44 regular, uh, was brought back in for repair and dry cleaning. The repair consisted of the replacement of the underside navy and white anchor tool fabric on the left hip pocket with no remaining navy and white anchor tool fabric left. The fabric used for the hip pocket repair was a navy and white twill with two white cross tennis rackets. And that will also be in the show notes. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so you're saying there was a different fabric that was used to make alterations or a repair of the jacket, and it never really, you didn't have any, he didn't have any details on what the damage was. No, he didn't. But in um, one of the pictures in the show notes is of a small tag that was found by the tailor inside of the jacket that I had uh, Mm-hmm. So back on some buttons, it says 44 regular. And then at the top, it says PT 574. And I asked him what that meant. And he said that means previously tailored uh, the fifth month, which is January, February, March, April, May, May of 1974. And that is uh, right around the time when Jaws started filming, right? Was Didn't they start f- filming in 1974 in May of mm-hmm. 19- May 2nd, right? In May 2nd, 1974. Mm -hmm. So this tag, we have a close-up of it, of Johns Taylor actually finding the tag inside the jacket where it says PT-574, previously tailored 5, 1974, and it's a 44 regular. Is it possible, John, the alterations were made for Murray Hamilton or it was damaged on set and then it was altered to fix because they already filmed him in this jacket? And then they altered it to fix the jacket so they could film other scenes with him in it. Let's talk about the damage here. We have to look at why would their alterations would have been made in 574, May 74. What possibly could have been the damage that was to one side of the jacket that they needed fixed? 
And we do know that there is a, a legend that came from the set of Jaws. John, do you want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so the legend about what happened to the anchor jacket and why it does not appear in the rest of the film during its runtime, as, as legend goes, Murray Hamilton and a bunch of the other actors and extras and the crew members, they had went to a local pub, a bar mm -hmm. on the island one afternoon after filming. Well, Murray Hamilton had a little bit too much to drink, and then he went outside of the bar and he picked up a cat. Except it wasn't a cat; it was a skunk, and it sprayed him. And as the legend goes, the wardrobe department could not get the smell out of it, and they burned it. I think I read that somewhere. Maybe I'll be able to find a reference uh, later on. I think it was in the Jaws log with the Carl Gottlieb writer. I believe it was. wrote about that as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that they burned his clothes because I remember the the I think the story goes that he had the skunk and he uh, didn't realize what it was. He put it down and then he went back and he was in the lobby of the hotel and he if he was wearing that jacket they might have tried to clean it and then burned it while they were maybe maybe singed it trying to get extract the smell out of it. That would make sense. And then so therefore it would need the alterations. It would need the repairs in order to get back to wearable fashion and finish out the rest of the filming. Okay, yeah, over on page 106 of the Jaws Log by Carl Gottlieb, he writes, Poor Murray Hamilton was most anxious about the progress of the film. His original commitment had been based on the outmoded production board, and as his original few weeks stretched into a month or more, he faced enormous conflicts with other satisfying parts on the legitimate, legitimate stage. Playing the mayor of Amity, he had gotten trapped on the island and would unwind in the evenings as best he could. One night... After a particularly intense unwinding session, he was making his way back to the hotel when he happened to spot a cute little doggy rummaging around an unattended garbage can. Murray bent to pet the little doggy, which had the cute white stripe running down its back. Yup, it was a skunk, and Murray caught a full blast from the little furry creature. He was so unwound at the time that he didn't perceive his new fragrance, and he continued back to the hotel. So a, a few dozen showers later, and with a good suit, sorrowfully burned, Along with the blanket, Murray was ready to face his day off. Well, the closest we can come to some sort of history of Murray Hamilton actually having a run-in and his clothes getting ruined by a skunk. Could this be the mm -hmm. possible reason why that suit jacket had alterations made? Um, we don't know. We can't. Be. Yep, we can't verify it. But we do know that the jacket had alterations made five nineteen seventy four. It's possible, and if it was fixed. To film more scenes in the jacket and they never did then that would make sense as to why one side of the jacket lines up perfectly and the other doesn't right however that does pose the question if there wasn't any more if there wasn't another bolt of fabric then where did the rest of that fabric come from it's not very that side of the jacket's not very wide because it's not like it's the full front of the jacket mm -hmm. it's just that one side so they could have taken what was supposed to be a long pillowcase and just stripped it down and just replaced it that way. The excess fabric that they had that were making and they could have altered the jacket to fix it and repair it. This is just unbelievable because we've narrowed it down to, we actually have activity with the jacket while Jaws is being made. We also have the jacket. It's the 44 regular that went to the Kennedys. So it's very possible, and one side completely matches up with what we saw, what we see in the um, fairy sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there are a lot of similarities. So this is just this is unbelievable that we're able to make this connection. This this piece of history has come into your possession at this time. Paul Winston was also able to give you the original mother of pearl buttons. Correct. That came on all the jackets, and you were able to have those. Mm -hmm. Um, because the jacket, when you got it, it did not have the original mother of pearl buttons, correct? Correct. It had a uh, black wood carved buttons is actually what I have. Okay. And so he was able to give you some original ones that they had left over in the shop. And you were able to have those placed back on the jacket to get it into the most accurate uh, look that closest to that era that we see Mayor Vaughn wearing, right? Correct. He also gave me uh, two of the original labels that would have came in it as well, sewn into it. Oh, is, is that these photos that we have here? We have the two original labels? Mm -hmm. Correct. Wow. So, Chip, it says New York and New Haven. Do we know about this New Haven? Was it an alternate location? It was an alternate location. See, so this is really interesting. See, New Haven, Connecticut is not that far 
from Martha's Vineyard. Can mm-hmm. actually, you can actually see that if they had some damage or they needed to alter or they needed to make some repairs on the set of Jaws, the costuming would have sent some guy with the jacket over to New Haven, probably dropped it off, and then that person would have driven it down to New York City for the repairs. So Chip actually had a presence in New Haven and New York. It's, it's fairly amazing that we actually can draw these lines here just from the history of this jacket. In my history of watching the movie with uh, friends and family over the years, people tend to laugh at this jacket. They say it looks a little tacky mm-hmm. or it looks a little bit too 70s because you're not seeing the intricacy of it. It looks like it's a light blue jacket or a gray jacket with anchors on it. But you don't see the intricacy, right. the actual handmade details when you until you get up close to this and you actually see it's actually pretty neat looking sports coat. This is something that in a super wealthy family would have had in the 60s. We do know this is the one that went to the Kennedys. You've 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 already deconstructed mm-hmm. that. We got that from the information. John, wild, wild times here on the Jaws Obsession. Is it possible, one more question for you, is it possible to reverse engineer this jacket? And do you have any plans to use it to model maybe a recreation tribute jacket, maybe for Quint Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com? Possibly in the future, in, in anything is possible to be possible to be replicated. It's just a thing of cost and time on how much that would cost to do, and it's something I've looked into, and I might do it in the in the future, possibly for the for the fiftieth. I might do it a special edition. I'm sure if you took pre orders, people would be lining up, and you can count me as one of them. Put me down for one. I need a forty six. <laughs> 46 long, please. Okay. And so okay. we wear the same size. That's right. Because you've seen it over the years. You've seen recreations. You've seen sort of cosplay type things. And no one can ever get it right because no one actually had their hands on the exact original and that they had, they could mm-hmm. actually duplicate. And you are in a position to actually do that and make Jaws fans for the next 50 years extremely happy to actually have in their wardrobe the anchor suit jacket worn by Mayor Vaughn. Excellent to see. Do you have any, uh, are you still in contact with Mr. Winston? Uh, I am off and on. It's amazing that you've established these little relationships uh, with these families that have come. Oh, one more question. Before the family got it, this um, this teacher that had it, any history mm-hmm. into this teacher? Where did he teach? Where did he, where he may have picked up this jacket in the 80s because Jaws would have sold off their, they were selling off their stuff. The Jaws production was selling their stuff in 1974 as the production wrapped in late in the fall of 1974. So do you have any theories of how maybe this teacher might have acquired the jacket? Well, that's one thing I asked and the family really did not know how, when or where he acquired it but it seems like wendy had told me that he had acquired the jacket before he started teaching wendy and her husband when he was teaching at another school rather okay and i don't remember where he was teaching at that time but he had never he had never told her how he acquired she had said that he was all he, he was real big in the film movies and everything she said he'd go places and he'd buy these different things kind of like what i do collect prop collecting right so uh, if i had to guess he that's probably how he acquired the jacket was prop collecting at a very early time and he had the wherewithal to realize what the jacket was wow that's just unbelievable unbelievable and you can't understate this this is one of the jackets of one of the three jackets that were made verified by the uh, son of the man who started Chip's Clothing Company in New York City, and he actually verified that this was one of the three jackets that were made. And what were the dates that he said that they, they, they actually made this fabric and these jackets? They were made in, he didn't give me the date for when they were first created, mm-hmm. but the, quote, Kennedy's jacket was sold in the spring of 1961. And the third anchor jacket, with the 46 long, was sold sometime in 1967 or 1968. Mm-hmm. And the one-off red jacket was sold in 1969 in a woman's size 6. Wow. So we're talking that this is a uh, 60s era jacket. And when it comes down to it, this is what's great. When it comes down to it, John, let's work this in. The Book of Quint takes place from... 1945 all the way to 1968. 
it's very possible that we will see this jacket return to the big screen in the six, if we have an expanded Jaws universe in the 60s. How would that make Jaws fans out there? Wouldn't that make everyone's day to see this jacket return to the big screen? That would be amazing. What do you think? Oh, I think people would be very blown away to see it in there, especially in the very climactic scene. Yes. People that have read the book. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to make for an epic, epic silver screen moment. It's all possible. It's all going to happen. Now, I don't think this is by chance. I think there is a higher power at work here as we get closer with the development of book to screen on the Book of Quint. Here comes into our orbit one of the three actual anchor suit coats that was in Jaws, the 44 regular that went to the Kennedy family. It's now in our orbit. John has possession of it. It's ready to make another appearance on the big screen. John, thank you so much for coming on here and teaching us about this piece of Jaws history, this artifact, this this is this historical artifact of Jaws history. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. For everybody out there, please go visit John and support him over at Quince Shark and Shack over at Etsy.com. Follow him with his Orca Rebuild Project. It's just great to have you, John. This is just unbelievable. Still, after all these episodes, we're at episode 71. John made his first appearance here on episode two. And here we are. We're still breaking breaking new ground on the greatest movie ever. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just so entirely special that we can get so close to this piece of wardrobe that so many of us have watched and looked at and talked about over these years, over this last many years, since 1975. And John also included side-by-side comparison photos with the screen shots of Mayor Vaughn in Jaws as this jacket, as he has it positioned on a mannequin. And you can see that it's very similar in the the patterns, especially if you look on the right side lapel. It's a spot on, but if you look and you and you look at some of the sleeves and also on the left side, you can actually see that there are little differences there. The important shot, which you'll see on the Instagram page as well as our show notes, you will see the back seam that where it looks like on John's jacket when the over at Chip Clothing Store. The anchors are in straight lines as it goes from the back left side through the center seam. They have it lined up perfectly so those anchors all line up. If you look on Mayor Vaughn's jacket, on the jacket that Murray Hamilton is wearing, the anchors are a little offset there as it hits that center seam. So that lets me know is that that's a clue right there that it's possible that this is the 46 size 46 long jacket that was taken in. Maybe the wardrobe department for Jaws liked the jacket so much, but they had to make it fit Murray Hamilton, so they took it in the back to make it more narrow. And that's what tells me is that those those anchor lines are not as clean as if it was done over at the Chip Clothing Store in New York City. And we do know that John's jacket was altered in May, but could it also be the Mayor Vaughn jacket then was altered for some damage and they let it back out or they corrected that center seam in the back? A lot of questions. It's hard to tell, but as we know that this is the only verified surviving anchor jacket, only one of three that were made that could have been in the Jaws film. Amazing detail that we've seen. We actually can see this material now. We can see the sophistication of this jacket. So now from there, how can we apply the knowledge we gained from John's appearance about the anchor coat history? How can we now apply that to the Jaws universe? When I was writing the book of Quint and as I watched Jaws, these are real people to me. I don't see Murray Hamilton. I see Mayor Vaughn. I don't see Robert Shaw. I see Quint and Herschel Salvatore. And these are very, these are all real characters to me. So when I process this information, I say, how, what does this tell me about Mayor Vaughn? What does the anchor suit coat tell me about Mayor Vaughn? And what now we can see is that Mayor Vaughn is a very sophisticated and wealthy person on Amity. It is not a secret now that Larry Vaughn does make an appearance in the Book of Quint. And everything is backed up now by this knowledge that we have, this firsthand knowledge of the anchor coat. 
that Mayor Vaughn is a very sophisticated individual. He comes from a very wealthy family. If the Kennedy family were ordering custom suit coats from Chip's clothing store, Larry Vaughn would have been, the Vaughn family would have been doing that as well. That is what is so interesting here is that this jacket that we see him wearing, it actually shows the sophistication and the wealth that the Vaughn family is just as powerful on Amity Island as the Kennedy family would be in Massachusetts. And that is, there's a lot of influence there. And that's what that jacket brings. It not only backs that up, but it tells us that at the same time, it stands out. This was custom made, one of three jackets that were custom made. And Larry Vaughn was one of those in the 60s that purchased this jacket. That's what's so exciting about this is that we've taken an artifact from Jaws and we've used it now to bolster and expand the Jaws universe and to get our greater understanding of who Mayor Vaughn is. Wealthy, politically motivated, as well as shopping at the same place that the Kennedys shop at. So cool to find this out. The anchor coat tells us so much more about the expanded Jaws universe than we might have realized, and I hope you can see that too. Before we close out episode 71, I want to take this time to recognize Sidney and Paul Winston. Sidney, the father, was the founder and owner of Chip's Clothing Company in New York City and New Haven. They had an alternate location in New Haven, Connecticut. And his son, Paul, also worked there and ran the shop as well. And Sydney has since passed away. Paul is now 96 years old. I also found out from John, I asked about the movie Jaws. And at 96 years, did Paul know that one of his jackets, one of his, one of his anchor suit coats was used in the movie Jaws? John actually reported to me that he was the one who broke the news to Paul, who lives down in New Jersey, 96 years old. He's not a movie guy. He, he's seen some of Jaws back when it was on TV, back in the 80s or the 70s when it was the ABC movie of the week, and he's never seen the whole thing straight through. So when John broke the news of what this jacket was and how many people have seen it and how it's talked about and how it's, it's portrayed, John said that Paul actually had to sit down. He was so shocked that one of his articles of clothing still exists and is, and is a cinematic find. It is an archaeological find, a piece of cinematic history in, in what arguably is the greatest movie of all time, Jaws. He had to sit down because he couldn't comprehend it. And then he said, and here's a quote from Paul Winston, 96 years old, he said he hadn't felt more alive in 50 years upon hearing the news that his anchor jacket was actually featured in the film Jaws. He saw John sent him screenshots of the movie Jaws he's, and, and also of the jacket, and Paul Winston firsthand verified that that is one of those coats that they made uh, at his father's shop. His father and him both worked on those jackets. If you open up the flap in the pocket, you can actually see the tennis rackets on one side. They, he verified that. John has included a picture of that that you'll see over in our show notes, that this is a verified chip anchor coat, one of three that were made. This jacket was made when, when Paul was in his 30s. And here he went for 50 years. Jaws came out in 1975. And he went almost 50 years not even knowing that his jacket was featured in the film. It was the intrepid work of John Tedder for him to be able to not only get the jacket, but then do the legwork to find out with no labels where this jacket could have came from. His investigation techniques able to reach out to Paul Winston and show this man that, that him and his father created something that will go on to stand the test of time, not only for 50 years, but for another 50 years after 2025. It's such a special episode. I, I'm, I'm almost at a loss for words to comprehend what is happening, what has happened over the course of this episode. It's simply amazing. I just want to say from the Jaws community, from all of us in the Jaws obsession, I want to say a huge thanks to Paul Winston. If you're listening out there, that you and your father that you created something that had a serious effect in all of us. As we watch this, that anchor jacket became synonymous. That anchor jacket became the symbol of Mayor Vaughn. And uh, my whole childhood, 
that was a recognizable jacket. And I wanted to say that that little interesting signature that you left in the world that you and your father created was then put into this movie for all of us to enjoy. And I can't thank you enough, Mr. Winston, Mr. Paul Winston, for the information that you have given to John and that we were able to share with the rest of the world here because you have allowed us to be closer to this movie that we all love, Jaws. Thank you very much, Paul Winston. And this show is dedicated to your father, Sidney Winston, and you yourself for everything they did in creating designer men's clothes through the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Thank you very much, Mr. Winston, for sharing your father's legacy and the details into the making of this suit jacket. A huge thank you from all of us here at the Jaws Obsession. This has been Episode 71, Anchor Coat History. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago. It's got right to my head. Wherever I may roam, by land or sea or foam. I can't thank John Tedder enough for simply amazing all of us in the Jaws Obsession and bringing us a wealth of knowledge on all these appearances that he's done ever since episode two. Thank you very much, John. Uh, please go visit and sponsor him over at his Etsy shop at Quince Shark and Shack. You can find the link for the uh, his Etsy shop in the description of this broadcast in whatever podcasting platform you're listening on. I also want to thank uh, Cole's Books over in England, Caroline over there, for the autographed edition. 100 autographs are ready to go out on November 15th. You can call over there or order online to reserve your copy. Thank you also to Always Great to See. Thank you so much to all the new fans, the Henry Cavill fans that have joined us here at the Jaws Obsession. We are just on a fast-moving freight train, and we're not stopping. We're going to go all the way. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within Section 107 of the Copyright Act. Copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act. All rights reserved to the copyright owners. Thank you very much for listening again to episode 71. Please join us over at Instagram.com at Book of Quint for the 31 days to the book countdown. Day 20 coming up soon, and we'll see you over there. Until next show, farewell and adieu, and show me the way to go home. <laughs>